Yo, and welcome into week 12 of pre-gaming the SEC. Jacob Pester and Chris Doring back with you to break down all the latest and greatest in the SEC. But you know what? A lot of times we open up the podcast, we have a format. We go hold my beer, we go last call, we go guest. Then we go to the pre-gaming portion of pre-gaming the SEC. Don't worry, we have great guests lined up. Today, we have got Billy Lucci, Tex Ags, is going to join us. All of the latest coming out of College Station. If you're listening to this podcast now, you already know Jimbo Fisher let go at Texas A&M. Also get a little bit into the Mississippi State situation with our guy, Billy Lucci. We've got Travis Denning, who is the ultimate UGA fan. You probably know that name because you've heard him on the radio as well. Country music artist later on in the show. So we have you know, a format that we stay true to 11 weeks so far and actually a couple of years now so far here on the podcast. But something happened on Saturday night that I think we really need to kind of change some of our format. And that is when your two schools play each other, you have to get into the nitty gritty of it. Christopher Paul Doring and, you know, when to- one yeah. And when one school's now won, you know, 11 out of the last 14 and, and five of those in a row, I feel like it needs to, you know, kind of lead the podcast. And so LSU 52, Florida 35 in Death Valley this weekend. I'll, you know, I'm a good host. I'll throw to you anything that you'd like to say about what happened in Death Valley. Here's the thing, bro. And I want credit for this. And 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 Big Turp, you can play the tape back. You've been part of these shows that we've done for a long time, whether it be off campus or the podcast has. I've been talking about Jaden Daniels should win win the Heisman since probably the the end of September, and watching, yeah. you know, what he's done during October and November has done nothing to change my opinion of that. Watching the way that he makes grown men, really talented defensive players, look uh, is is impressive. The seven hundred plus yards that they put up, doing something that he did in terms of his rushing and passing combination, never been done before at the FBS level. Um, just continues to show that he is the, whether you want to call it the most outstanding player, the most valuable player, uh, the best season. I I love Michael Penix Jr. I love Bo Nix, but those guys aren't doing what, what uh, is being done there in Baton Rouge by Jaden Daniels. And it just makes you think, and I know probably rubbing salt in the wound for you, but like if they had any semblance of a defense, what this team could have accomplished this year. Yeah. We're not talking about number one defense in the country. We're talking about 60th, if they went from like whether like 95th or something to 60th in the country, what they could do, maybe only have one loss on the season and setting themselves up for a potential playoff run. But, you know, LSU's defense is not that. And Jaden Daniels, through all of that, has still led his team to a very quality season. They've got some big wins. I mean, they you know, look, they've played four top 10 teams away from Baton Rouge, and they, they've only gotten one of the four, but. He's played well in all of those games. I think that's the difference. Like, it hasn't been because of Jaden Daniels. And to set an SEC total yardage record, okay, against the Florida Gators, to do something that's never been done in FBS history. We've played college football for a long time, over 150 years. And to throw for over 350, run for over 200 in the same game. And again, not to do it against directional school U, but to do it against the Florida Gators. And I... To what Florida's record is, I, that doesn't matter. It's Florida. Okay. Yeah. They've got Jimmy's and Joe still. And to run 85 yards and to pull away from Florida defensive backs, like that's rare. And like that's a record that's special and it should be special because of who you did it against. And so when you say it's never been done in FBS history and you do it against a rival in a conference game and you've really done that all season long. He's got to be he's got to be in New York at minimum, but he's got to be a front runner, in my opinion, after what he just did. Let me give your perspective or get your perspective on on Florida. I think I'm I'm too close to it a lot of times. Having followed them all year, watching them in person, I mean, I feel good about the offense. I feel good about Graham Mertz. I mean, I think he's really one of the bright spots this year. Great identification of a guy that would fit well in your system, and and they've they've done a a good job of putting weapons around him to allow the passing game to grow this year. But as you look at the state of the program, how would you evaluate the season that Billy Napier is having in year two in Gainesville? I agree with you on the offense. I know a lot of people want to say empty calorie games for Graham Merch, but I do think he's more than that. And I think it is something where you're seeing a player that if he would have 
been in the system two, three years, he would really thrive. You're seeing a player that you can tell it's on the verge CD of turning into something special. Mm -hmm. And we've always known he's talented. I mean, he was what the highest recruited quarterback ever at Wisconsin. So we've always known that talent was there. And it's so close to like taking that next step and going to the next level. We know you've got two really good running backs. I love the use of their running backs. And I love the scheme they have in the running game. Ricky Pearsall is just a dog. I mean, he is going to be highly competitive. He's going to try to make every single catch. And so I could sit here and I could wax poetically about the offense because I do think they're on to something. It's just, again, not there yet to the level they need to have it at, but it is very close. Defensively, we've had this conversation. They take a lot of chances. There's a lot of things that Florida does that it, there's an aggressive nature to it. And some of that stuff can be really, really good. But you and I talked about this yesterday. Uh, let's go back and let's look at, you know, some of the stuff we were looking at as far as pressures. And this is going to be a defense that you're going to have to make sure you have it all blocked up. But against them this year, teams have thrown three, uh, 317 passes. They have brought pressure on 157 of those. Basically, half 49.5% of the time, they are bringing pressure. They have brought the nickel 13% of the time this year. They have brought corner cat 10% of the time this year. They have brought at least five 46% of the time. They've brought six guys 20% of the time. They are a pressure team. That can be great against an inexperienced offense, one that – you know, you get into a game against Florida, they're coming from all angles, you don't know how to pick it up, and you're going to have a negative play because of it. But when you play a team that has a veteran quarterback, right, when you have a team that has somebody like a Jaden Daniels, after about three of those CD, and he's seen it on tape, he's like, okay, well, I know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. I trust my offensive line. And else has got a good offensive line, but I'm going to get it blocked up. And because you're being so aggressive, I'm going to have advantages in the back end and so how they work that out in the future, how do they hone in on, we can be this aggressive nature defense because I do like that, but we also have to realize our opponent. I think defensively, that's where they're still needing to make that next step. I don't think it's as close as the offense is. And again, I think they've got one of the best young defensive coordinators in football who's only going to get better. But that's the one adjustment I would say. When you're playing someone that is a veteran player that's going to be able to figure us out a little bit, maybe dial it back a little bit and change some of the things you're doing. The problem is still the, the lingering problem from the last couple of years. They don't have the defensive line. They don't have the individual players up front to be able to consistently you know, create pressure without yeah. having to, to do some of the more aggressive things. So, you know, I, I like the idea. I'm not going to, you know, the, the, the death by a thousand cuts is not, you know, something that I'm okay with. So yeah. Were they a little overly aggressive at times? Sure. There's a lot of young guys that are playing right now. A lot of inexperienced guys in this defense that are playing that I think it shows um, there's an the athleticism, but I, I do think at some point you got to kind of simplify and just let them go play and see if you can't win a ball game that way. So I do think it's gonna it's it's quite a difference than where we were, you know, just three weeks ago or four weeks ago, whatever it was, heading into the Georgia game where Florida was five and two, and you're thinking, man, they got a chance to to maybe win seven, eight games this yeah. year. It, 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 they're going to be lucky to get to six now, and um, you know, I I think that that's kind of the tough reality that Florida fans are are, are starting to realize. Still have a very solid recruiting class. You still sit there at number four. I know you got jumped by Florida State, but still number four. You're losing guys, though. There's You're losing guys. And there's some ones that are on the horizon, from what I understand, as well. CD, if you don't get to six wins, how much does that affect the recruiting class? And then what's the narrative all offseason in Gainesville? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's as much about the wins and losses as it is, you know, what you're able to pony up for, you know, additional requests True. for NIL money. You know, I, I think yeah. that that's what you're seeing as you come you come down the stretch run before the, the de December 20th signing day um, reports that I've heard are that there are some of these guys that are asking for astronomical figures that Florida's not willing to, 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 to pony up. And I don't blame them for that. So I, it's just the reality of the whole deal. But I do think a guy like DJ Lagway has been a solid uh, commit from the get go and what he's done in helping to recruit others, uh, I think has been a big part of this class coming together and i hope a big part of it staying together yeah 
I also think, you know, I, Alyssa Lang and I had this conversation on Thursday on, on SEC this morning. Graham Mertz could use another year if he wanted to. He's got another yeah. COVID year. Like, it, what a great bridge from where they are now to letting Lagway come in and learn from him and 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 kind of get acclimated and then take over after the, the 2024 season's over with. So I don't know how it'll play out, but, um, you know, I think he's obviously the crown jewel of that class, yeah. and the most important guy in the long term. All right, CD, uh, I know we kind of started this podcast different than we normally do. We kind of got away from our format because our two schools played each other. But I know before we move on to our guy, Billy Lucci, you did have a shout out for Mizzou that you wanted to make sure you got out here on the pod. Also, shout out to our guy, Eli Drinkwitz. Yeah. Uh, he found out how much of a fan we are of Cody Schrader and what he's doing. He gave us some love this week, and Drink, you know you're our guy, so we appreciate the love, Drink, and we appreciate the way your team's playing as well. I mean, I did have to go to your defense. Uh, he, you did. He questioned where the love was coming from from Jacob Hester, former running back in this conference that knows you know what what is being done by Cody Schrader is, is not something that's done every single day, but uh, I did defend your honor. I did defend the fact that here on, on uh, pregame in the SEC, you've been uh, singing the praises of Cody Schrader. And, and actually I've told the story about what you said about backs being born, not bred. And uh, yeah, I think he agreed with that a little bit there too. All right. So, so it, it, Hey, it big sir, take... we got to get that. We got to get that clip. We need to get the clip of drink kind of, you know, asking where the love is and then maybe we can play the love right after. I'm we going to, make, to find the clip right now from that uh, Monday yeah. interview. So yeah, we got I, right here. I appreciate y'all's support. And, you know, the, the thing that's been dis disappointing for me is where is Jacob Hester on this Cody Schrader bandwagon? I mean, the guy is, I mean, is he jealous of all his success or what? Like, no, how hey, come we can't get him? I, hey, I'm not going to lie yeah. to you. Hey, he talked about this on our podcast the other day about how some guys are born to run the football. And, I, and after he talked about it, the feel that you have to have – Watching him and y'all's outside zone scheme, the patience that he has, mm -hmm. uh, he, he's he been high on Cody Schrader. I'm going to come to okay. the defense of my guy. He's been okay, building this okay. dude up for a while. I, he hadn't tagged me on Twitter with it, so I just didn't know. And, I, you know, I don't follow him. I'm not an easy follow. You know, I don't just follow anybody. So <laughs> Nice job, Big Turp. Nice job. Well done. All right, so what did you want to say, CD, about so the Missouri it's, Tigers? It's time, you know, to – as I'm watching the game on Saturday in the studio, I'm taking notes for the show Saturday night, but I'm also taking notes for our, our pre-gaming the SEC podcast, and I always write a little beer, question mark, and in, in my notes this week, <laughs> it was what uh, Missouri did, and I know you love this, but when you – hey, you, you, you take somebody's strength, and you beat them at their own game, that's the ultimate hold my beer. Oof, you think you're a pretty no good doubt. running team? Hold my beer. We're going to shut that down. You think you're a pretty good against the run? Hold my beer. We're going to run for 250. I mean, they they ran the ball 51 times and only threw it 24 times. And I asked Drink about it. I said, what, what made you think that you guys would be able to run the football at the defense that was number one against the run in the conference coming in? He said, I, I, first and foremost, our offensive line has been doing a great job. I felt like we'd be able to take advantage of their tackles. And then when you have a guy that's as patient as, as Cody Trader is in that outside zone scheme, uh, the way that he reads that out, the way that he he's able to press the hole and, and, and cut it back the way that he's able to run with that physical kind of nature to him. It, it's, it's uh that's the way it's supposed to run. And then to see him catch the ball out of the backfield too. What a compliment to uh, his running ability to have the hands and, and route running that he also has. Yeah, to run like he did, also be over 100 yards receiving. I mean, he is like the ultimate hold my beer, without question. I mean, I said it. If I owned a college football player jersey, it would be Schrader, that number seven Missouri black jersey, which I think is one of the best we have in the SEC. So we might need to make that happen. Also, like I'm going ahead right now making the executive decision. We are going to have a pre-gaming the SEC end of the year SEC awards. Yeah. All right. We're going to have offense player of the year, defense player of the year, coach of the year. And, you know, maybe we can have like uh, most improved because I feel like if there's any podcast that deserves to throw out a, like a most improved award, it has to be former two star and walk on football player that turned into all SEC players. No question. Uh, we definitely <laughs> got to do that, man. So, uh, I, I look forward to that. I mean, we're getting close here. We don't have much time oh, left. I know. And, uh, it, it, time runs short for sure. But a lot of, uh, I think the the funny, you know what we need to do is go back to our first show of the year, Big Terp, and, and find some of the predictions we made. Because I I had to go to um, 
to Huntsville, Alabama. I was I was speaking up there in August, and I, I may have mentioned this to you guys, but I had a terrible travel day, flight delays, missed connections, trying to adjust to fly somewhere else to drive, and 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 ended up getting stuck in in Charlotte. Well, they asked me. They said, "Hey, send us over some thoughts on things that you you would have talked to us about. How you think the season's going to play out?" So I actually went back this past Tuesday, or uh, yeah, Tuesday to speak. Yeah. They printed it out for me. And I'm reading through some of the things. I think Alabama won't win 10 games this year. And I think that the most improved teams or the undervalued teams in the conference are going to be Kentucky and Mississippi State. And the coach isn't even around there anymore. Like it is embarrassing how yeah. far off I was. And I think a lot of the same opinions that I had were ones that you shared with me as well. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Like I think you and I wanted to give ourselves over to Mizzou so badly because of what we think of yeah. Eli Drinkwitz and Blake Baker and what Kirby Moore could do. But let's be honest, full disclosure, like we talked about it. We were on the verge of doing it, but we never pulled that trigger. And now Eli Drinkwitz is somebody that you can see like the vision he has for that program and the things surrounding that program. It's not a flash in the pan. Like that feels like that's the level that they're going to achieve now moving forward. Yeah, I think it's the uh, number two guy in the country we're, like committed to them right now. I've said it with you time and time again. The Luther Burden get and keep is yeah. maybe the most important thing that they've been able to to do to to, to show people in that you know that Missouri area that uh, you can come to the in-state school, you can have great individual success, you can play for championships, and uh, you're going to move on and get a chance to play in the NFL. So, I, I a proof of concept is something I'm sure they're selling big time in and around the state yeah. of Missouri. All right, before we get to our guest, Billy Lucci of Texax, who's about to join first us. First guest, to by the way. We got mul- this is, a, is this the first time we've ever had multiple guests? I think so. I feel pretty confident. Big Turf's giving us the confirmation. Yes, multiple guests. But the first guest is going to be Billy Lucci of Texax to break down all the latest in the Jimbo Fisher news and also where Texas A&M is looking for their next head coach. But before we do that, I want to tell you about our friends over at Richards Honda. Go to richardshonda.com. That is the website. No matter what you're looking for, they've got you covered. If you need the midsize SUV, if you need the Odyssey minivan, if you need the Ridgeline truck, if you need a sedan, if you need a hybrid, whatever it is, they have got you covered. Again, go to the website, richardshonda.com. That is Richards Honda, home of the warm and fuzzy feeling. All right, as we mentioned, very excited for our very special guest this week on pre-gaming the SEC. That is our guy, Billy Lucci, executive editor and co-owner of texags.com. He is the guy that broke the story on Sunday that Texas A&M was moving on from head coach Jimbo Fisher. Luch, well, always a pleasure. On. What's that feel like, Luch, to break a story? Like, I saw your ni- name being quoted by everybody on the bottom line, tickers on their own tweets. Like, it's got to be pretty cool to be the first to a story, right? Or not, I mean, not cool in this case. It's like reporting it somebody's death, but like that's not cool. But. Yeah, yeah, I don't like the I don't like the fact that I had to break that actual story. Um, but it is the job, right? And yeah. uh, I felt like CD for a day. I mean, it was <laughs> no, it, it's cool, Chris. Like, because you know, it's it's what I it's what I do. And I remember, shoot, back when you know, I was breaking a lot of the news of A&M to the SEC and that realignment um, was kind of the first time that a a college fan site person, you know, and there's hundreds of us in the country was like getting recognized on the national stage. I can remember the first time I saw my name go across that, that ESPN scroll and I was freaked out hoping that I was right because I knew I was. Like, <laughs> they suspended Manziel for one half of one game. That doesn't feel right, but I, I know who I got it from, and I know it's true. And and it was the one time I wanted the ESPN thing to say, ESPN confirms. Now, by the time they do it, now I'm like, no, no, no. I said that. Yeah. <laughs> But it, it's cool. It's fun, and it's you know it's the it's the competitive part of it. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, I was watching College Game Day Saturday morning, kind of knowing, and I was going, it'd be kind of funny on, during uh, Game Day in SEC Nation to drop that bomb. It was yeah. about if anyone was getting tired of hearing about Jim Harbaugh, I had the cure for that, <laughs> but I would never have done it. Plus, I'll be honest, there was part of me that was. I was just going, do I, because I knew since that Regents meeting Thursday and then a little after that found out, 
oh, it's actually going to be this weekend, not before or after LSU. Luch, when did and, you think Jimbo found out? So, like, Board Saturday, of Regents no. meeting on Thursday. He didn't find out till Saturday? He did not. I, I know factually he didn't find out. And I don't – I say Saturday night, like, in the in the locker room after the game. Not in the locker room, but in the building after the game. Right. From what it sounds like that I've learned since is that it was more of a uh, – I thought he was going to let go, let get let go after the game, and then it was more of a, hey, you know, I guess you know from Ross Bjork, we need to meet tomorrow morning, um, and I think that's probably when he realized it. Probably, you know how coach, we all know how it goes, and they probably immediately call your agent and say, hey, what's going on here? And you know, Jimmy Sexton's been through that drill hundreds of times, and. So probably Saturday night, but not for sure, but probably just assumed it when he went to bed Saturday. I, yeah. That part of the job sucks. And people think, oh, he got all this money and and that's great. You know, Hess, you played for him. And and that stuff's brutal. And I try yeah. to tell people, Jimbo Fisher's a great football coach. He, he, you know, he's a human being. That's the kind of stuff that PB said. PB doesn't understand what it feels like to fail at something yeah. and have that bother you. The, 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 the money is like, that's an afterthought. You know, yeah. it, it's the idea that I'm going to come in here and I'm going to fucking crush it. Right. And then you don't end up crushing it and you're sub, uh, subsequently let go and people telling you you're not good enough. And we all know, yeah. like you said, what a great coach Jimbo Fisher has been and, and still probably will be. I mean, I, I guess my question to you, Luch, is like, have you talked to him at all? I mean, you guys worked closely together for six years. Have you guys yeah. been able to have a conversation? No, I've talked to his right hand man, Mark Robinson, who was also let go. You know that usually when you're just aligned yeah. right there, and and I've known Mark for 25 years. He's a dear friend, and uh, and I consider Jimbo one too. And I plan to talk to. I was actually going to call him today. You know, I wanted to let it settle for a little bit, but I was going to call him today. And unfortunately. I've been through this, you know, when Kevin Sumlin was coaching, I mean, he's been, I can't tell you how many times we've sat in this living room and talked football and life. And, and, you know, I had to cover his firing and we, we managed to stay friends. That wasn't, you know, that's not always easy. It's tough, but uh, you know, it's, it's part of the job. You understand that. And, and I understood what A&M saw in terms of what, the, the body of work prior to Saturday night and, and the resources that they had committed to him, not just in his yeah. salary, but every, every which way under the sun. And then I also saw like, you know, where, how are you coming out of this? And my, the one thing I had a problem with and I kept trying to think about it was you kept going, can he turn it around in year seven? Mm -hmm. Uh, what if you just give him one more year? Can he get it done with Wigman back? And, you know, that was unfortunate. And so many of these losses were close this year. One more year. Can he get it done? Or the other part of it was, but can you fire him because of the contract? And to me, when those are the kind of questions you're asking and the other side of that is this, this body of work with the, you know, the current trends, which were 10 and 11 in the last 21, nine straight road losses, six and 12 in your last 18 games against power five, five losses in a row at the time of the Mississippi schools, you start seeing those things. And, and I don't mean that as a knock against them, but I mean that as when you've got the resources that A&M does and the coaching salary pool that A&M does and all that versus what, what those schools are working with, it just makes it more glaring when you're not beating them. So all of that piled up on one side and, and hope on the other I mean, I get it. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean it's fun. It doesn't mean that you uh, don't feel bad for all parties involved. Billy, how surprised are you that it didn't work out? Because I'll be honest with you, I'm highly surprised. Mm -hmm. and, and look, I realize I realize they've been looking for the right coach, and it's been 25 years since you won a conference championship, and you get a guy like Jimbo Fisher in, who's got the national championship, who has conference championships as a head coach, and certainly as an offensive coordinator. He knows what it looks like to win football games. I thought it was a slam dunk. I mean, I wanted him to be the coach of LSU, right, at the time, and then A&M gets him. How did it go wrong? Where did it go wrong? Because I am still surprised it did not work out. 
Yeah, I am too. I mean, I think the it, it, you can almost define it as like close, but it, this season was like his whole tenure. Yeah, like really close. The only thing missing this season, and and, and maybe they'll go knock off your Tigers in Baton Rouge in some high scoring shootout. Who knows? I, who knows if Bobby Petrino what this offense might look like. I, that would be fascinating if it looked a lot different in a couple weeks. But mm. the only thing missing this year is Jimbo typically had one. It's like one monster game a year. Um, but he got so close. And and this year they were close and couldn't do it. Quarterback injuries kind of defined, you know, outside of Kellen Mond. It was like after that, the last three seasons, they've had, I think, about six QB injuries that knocked guys out for the year. Yeah. So – but I I think Esther like the they could never quite get the offense you know they would tease you at times yeah. but it, was, it wasn't ever really a good offense uh, twenty twenty though it, where I think it went wrong was twenty twenty they went nine and one they just missed the playoffs they won in New Year six they were top five finished number four in the country like. People want to asterisk that with a with a COVID thing. I'm like, they didn't make the playoff because of COVID, because Trevor Lawrence caught COVID and Notre Dame beat them. They beat, you know, if they Notre Dame didn't win that game, if they'd have lost it, AM is the fourth team in the playoff. They also wouldn't have played Florida, who was really good that year, and they wouldn't have played Tennessee. They would have replaced them with like a one in eleven Colorado and Fresno State, who wasn't good. They would have been 12 and one. Ohio State would have played pro- an extra five games and could have lost. AM probably in a non-COVID season with that football team is actually in the playoffs. So they had a great year in 20. And then 21, they stumbled out of the shoot and they beat number one Alabama. They beat number 11 Auburn. They were rolling into Oxford. And people forget two years ago right now in November, they were number 11 favored against Ole Miss. Yeah. LSU wasn't good. They were going down there to play them with Max at quarterback and Edo. And they lost both those two games at the very end. Uh, Ole Miss a little earlier, like a possession or two left in the game. They blew those two games. And, and I could go even deeper in the ways they lost them were the same ways they've been losing games since. But that was their point to go 9-1, and one, New Year's Six, 10 and two new year six rolling on a win streak two top 10 finishes they were about to sign the number one class i think the culture hester would have changed then he could never flip that culture and over time as you guys know better than me when you don't win enough guys kind of forget how to win and the message i think kind of goes stale and and he had his chance to flip it and it just didn't quite get there do you think he'll coach again? Do you think he's a guy that that uh, finds himself uh, sooner rather than later on the sideline again? Well, yeah, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I've already heard you know from people close to him that yeah you know, they're optimistic on places like you know they might they might get interest from Mississippi State. They might get interest yeah. from Michigan State. They you know there's a couple of people that told me that in coaching, hey, watch out for Brian Kelly. He's not you know perfect fit there in Baton Rouge he might be pursuing that Michigan job if it comes open I don't see Woodward letting him go but if it happened then you know <laughs> you might get your wish down there Hester and I'm <laughs> I'm exaggerating but my point right. is his name will come up and think about this this is kind of funny imagine Michigan State not having to pay Mel Tucker's buyout and then hiring Jimbo and a and M, there's no, you know, uh, no claws, right? Like no, no like, A and M, there's no offset. They're paying yeah. that, so they could pay him, you know, whatever they wanted to. They might be not paying Mel Tucker and paying Jimbo yeah. like a couple million a year to coach. So because of that, I think he's actually even more hireable. Yeah. Uh, I think he'll coach again, and and if not this year, probably by next year, he definitely wants to. Oh yeah, if West Virginia. Yeah. became open if neil brown for whatever reason they don't continue to move forward with him i know it looked better at the beginning of the season they kind of faltered down the stretch yeah. he would have a chance to go back home and still be in a you know major program in a major conference 
that'd be that'd be really cool. Like I, I'm 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 hoping for the best for him for sure. We know he can't sit still. We know we know he's not gonna just sit there and sit still. I don't even know, Luch, if he could do like TV or radio, because I don't I don't think it'd be enough for him. Like TV, like he'd want to talk about a play and you know TV, it's just quick little snippets. <laughs> I don't know that he could do that. He'd have no chance, I don't think. <laughs> let's spin it forward, Luch. Let's let's talk about um kind of what, what you think Ross Bjork and, and the search committee is looking for in a new head coach. I it's really interesting, Chris. I think I think you're gonna see a uh Ross is gonna try to, in my opinion, I don't mean this as, as a knock or anything. I think he's gonna try to hire someone in his kind of in his own image, maybe of like very structured, organized, uh, you know, just on a plan. And uh I also think he's gonna look at somebody that's if I think when he hires someone you're going to kind of see that he's won at every level, maybe not the most striking and not, maybe not the most striking resume in terms of he's not the head coach at Florida state. That's won a national title. He's right. not Brian Kelly from Notre Dame, Lincoln Riley going to USC from OU. I think it, if I was a betting man, I would bet it would be more something like Napier to Florida or uh, you know, Florida State going from you know Memphis to Tallahassee, or yeah. Kevin Sumlin to A and like De- DeBoer from Fresno State to Washington. So I, I don't think they're going to go snag the big fish. No pun intended. Like they did this past this past hire, they could though. So if the right name comes along, that's showing interest, yeah. they definitely will have the money to go spend. Is but Dabo that, Sweeney a, a legitimate prospect? I, I don't think so. I mean, I won't, I've learned to not say never, but I just it it would feel a lot like the Jimbo hire. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. I, but, I mean, it'd almost be identical to it, wouldn't yeah. it? And for a ton of money. Because yeah. you're still not getting Dabo for any kind of cheap. I think if they had a big splash hire, like that would – and again, there's there's some out there. I've heard there's some of the names that have reached out, and you have to sift through that and see who's serious or not. But I've heard it's just been stunning, which makes sense. I mean, for on both sides of it, the the guys looking for raises and the guys going, yeah, I'll take that job as much money as they're throwing around and 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 everything they pour into, uh, you know, trying to win championships down there. So, but DeBoer at Washington is a guy that I I know they're going to go after. Um, you know, at least to gauge interest, but I don't think he's going to be doing anything for another couple of weeks. And, and AM's timeline to me is I get a strong vibe. They're trying to have something done. You know, portal opens yeah. what, about two weeks from tonight. I think you'll see AM with a head coach in the next two weeks. So you think they'll name it before the end of the season, or you think it's uh, like a, a Sunday after the last game? I think you could see something. In the in the days following uh, LSU, yeah, the Thanksgiving weekend. So in the days following that, uh, you know, what would be interesting is if they hired somebody that's in some way, shape, or form involved in the playoff uh, or an NFL guy. I don't. I, I would be a little surprised if it were NFL. I'm looking at guys like you know, just that I I feel really confident that they're going to interview our uh, Jeff Trailer at UTSA. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously Mike Elko at Duke's yeah. going to get a big, big look. Uh, I think a, there's some buzz that like, Hey, let's see what Elijah Robinson does as the interim at A&M. Um, and then, and then, uh, who's the third one. I think Lance, uh, Leipold at Kansas will get a look. I, I, that was about to, I was about to ask you about him, Luch, because when you were talking about winter, maybe somebody a little bit different mold than Jimbo Fisher was. Lance Leipold at Kansas came to mind. You mentioned DeBoer at Washington and where he's won at every level, climbing at Kansas State. Those are yeah. just winners. Like, that's what they do. Whatever level it is, they go out there and they win. CD and I were talking about this on off-campus earlier. Like, Lance Leipold, Wisconsin Whitewater. He was like, what was it, CD? Like, 
104 and six or something like that. I mean, his yeah. record was literally ridiculous. 109 and six. He played yeah, 109 and six. And then he goes and he wins at a place like Buffalo and he, he's won at Kansas. That might be the most impressive yeah. of them all. Like wherever you put Lance Leipold, Luch, he just wins. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. No doubt. And, and look, you're sitting there. Sorry. My dog is we're, we're playing with uh, <laughs> early Christmas present. Oh, good. Um, no, but let, you know, it's impressive. And then you're beating Texas and Oklahoma at yeah. Kansas. So I think he certainly won. And you look at Elko and he's beating Clemson yeah. and, and taking Notre Dame to the final play at, at Duke and winning nine games a year before. Uh, Elko's an interesting one because everybody's asking me like, Hey, who's a hot coordinator? You know, Ole Miss got, you know, they didn't just take uh lane straight from <clears throat> Bama, but you know, uh Notre Dame promotes Freeman Ryan Day gets promoted at, uh, at Ohio State not that he was a coordinator but Dabo gets promoted from within you look at all these guys that this, that this has happened with where they've had success and I say well that's you know Lincoln Riley at OU but I go that for A&M that that is Elko the only difference is I agree yeah he went for two years and got some on the job training at, you know at a, at a power in a power five program in the ACC so to me, if you're if you're wondering that, I go well. That guy is, is Mike Elko, especially if he could keep. Uh, Great Elijah point, yeah. Robinson. Who's there? What's best. your What's your former roommate talking about, bro? You you no Deuce and Al Bobby Petrino style. Grit, low do. man wins, neck rolls, the things <laughs> that we all should it. talk about. <laughs> Bring it back. I thought he's. Uh, did he really say something today about he tells his family to wear diapers to the game? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so they don't absolutely. go to the <laughs> No, because you never know what he's going to do and how many fourth downs he's going to go oh, for. Oh, I thought yeah. we were talking about didn't want to leave. <laughs> In case they're a little nervous. I got gotcha. you. I just think, CD, that he is – I haven't even brought it up. Yeah. To, and because you know how it is. You just like – if that time ever comes and that time's right. But I, I, I always say about Dan, he will end up the head coach at A&M one day. I think it'll be like after whoever A&M hires now. I just don't know that the time – Dan is the most loyal person that, that I've ever met. And he is so uh, appreciative and grateful for every little thing that's good in his life. And for those, that lion's ownership to give him his shot yeah. Yeah. when other people he interviewed for several NFL yeah. jobs, you know, and, and what that team and their success is meaning right now to that city. Mm -hmm. Dan like ties himself to that. And uh, he's just too emotionally like attached, in my opinion. I love it. It's great to yeah. see in an yeah. era where everybody else is dipping out for a better. I would, option. I would, I, I've told Luch this before. I there's two men right now that I would run down on kickoff and tear both of my hamstrings for. Rich Basacci is one of them because I played for Rich. He was my special teams coordinator for the Chargers. He's now with the Packers. And someone I've never even met in my life, Dan Campbell, would be the other. If Dan yeah. Campbell called me right now, he's like, Hess, you're 38 years old. You got nothing left, but I need you for one. I'm flying up there and I'm running down that kickoff because he galvanizes a room like no other. I mean, Kelvin Shepard, my college teammate, is his linebackers coach in Detroit. And he said, Hess, it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen, him as a motivator. So, I mean, it, it's amazing to watch him work. And it's genuine, Luch. Yeah, it is. It is. And I've I've had conversations, you know, in the recent uh, past with guys like, you know, Matt Stafford, who who left there and, and had yeah. one conversation with him. It was like, you know, wow. I mean, that, you know, I think if it, basically if he wasn't, you know, trying to win a Super Bowl before he retired – he saw great things there from one conversation and, and Travis Kelsey talks about, you know, when he worked him out way back in the day, and yeah. one of his friends told me, man, when he came and that's when I, we knew he was going to, he's going to make it. And, and Dan told me about Travis. He said, I knew he was going to be a star when, and when I sat down with him, just when you just hearing him talk about football, like his, his knowledge of the game and stuff. So Dan's always looking, you know, and, and he just, He's a player's coach, but you know what? You'd run down on a kickoff for him, but CD, like, we'd have wanted him in Nashville or on Bourbon Street when we were all three <laughs> down there. Like, that's when you really want Dan. Yeah. Uh, that's when he really comes through. And, and uh, yeah, CD and, and DC would be a problem. I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> uh, but, no, I look, 
I, I just think he's, he's, I don't think he's, the time's not right for him. The time is right for him in Detroit. Uh, I do think he'd freaking crush it and kill it. Two guys I think that would kill it here would be him and Dan Lanning. Dan Lanning ain't going anywhere between right. not just his buyout, it's that and the Nike buyout or whatever you want to call it situation. I think it would cost the team, everybody says 20 million. Even if he said, I want to come, I'm leaving here, which I don't think he has any desire to, you're paying 40 plus close to 45 million, I think, to get him. Mm-hmm. And no one's talking about that. But yeah, that's how much I- I- any big jobs come open. That's how much you're going to pay just to get him out of there, not even talking about the contract. But those are two guys that, like, if yeah. you would have told me, money's no object take your picks those would probably be one two on my list let me ask you about the mississippi state job luge because obviously i mean you're dialed into the sec not just texas a&m i mean they make the move right after a&m both coaches in that game get let go zach arnett's not even there a full year like what's realistic for Mississippi State? Why did they make the move right after Texas A&M? Because they're not going after the same candidates right now. I mean, Jamie Chadwell, we've seen him. We've seen Willie Fritz from Tulane. Those are the names kind of attached to Mississippi State. So why do you think Mississippi State pulled the trigger so fast? I, I, it was probably similar. Well, I think A&M did it when they did just because of the timing of the Regents meeting, but also not to risk if you decided that's the move, you don't want to risk them beating uh, LSU and finishing five and three in the SEC and mm-hmm. everybody going, damn, he went five and three and, and ended the year beating LSU with, without a starting quarterback. The conversation with the people that make the decisions might start to change. At least you might end up with a riff. I don't know what Mississippi State was doing because no matter what Arnett did the rest of the year, including Ole Miss, that – storyline wasn't going to change so i guess they just did it now to say you know how these schools are let's get in the market a little a couple weeks earlier yeah let's they, they'd rather do it that way than have to sneak around behind the scenes and and communicate with people that way so i think they just wanted to get in the market i yeah i've heard chad well i think fritz i don't think fritz would be a, an a and m type of hire but i do think I promise you he was on the initial list. I, I think like this guy was right up the road at Sam Houston winning championships. He yeah. does it at two lane. All he's ever done, kind of like other guys we talked about, is win. I think that'd be a hell of a hire for Mississippi State. Um like I said, who knows? Maybe they'll maybe they'll look at Jimbo. Maybe uh I could see the one guy I could see overlapping on some of these jobs in terms of interest. I've heard that Mississippi State has also reached out to Trailer, so I think Jeff yeah. Trailer at UTSA would be a guy that Mississippi State and AM yeah. and probably well, I don't say probably. I'm not trying to predict what Arkansas does. I haven't heard uh, whether or not Sam Pittman is going to make it through the year or not. Damn, that was ugly uh, to yeah. Auburn this week, and that's I, I, I Sam Pittman. I, I really think pr- very highly of that dude as a coach, as as a man, but. You know, if he goes, Trailer will be a prime candidate there too. So I think he he could be a guy that's yeah. kind of mentioned at all three SEC West schools. It's so funny, man. I I think Hess and I talked about this. I've I've talked about it on some other shows. Like, you go back and look at the last two years, the lowest winning percentages over that period of time. Uh, Vanderbilt's at the bottom, but it also includes Auburn, A and M, Arkansas, and Florida. I mean, some really well funded programs that have great tradition that just haven't been able to win. And it, it's, it's such a, such a difficult conference to do that. And I look at like the job that, that, that now Ross Bjork has, I don't envy him. Like it, every, I, I mentioned, the other, what do you think the success rate on hiring a coach in the sec is? It's gotta be less than 20%, 15%, right? Yeah. I mean, look at it. Like Jimbo was the, at six years in, what was he? Was he the third longest tenured guy? I mean, yeah. Fourth, had to be, right. I mean, you had Nick, Stoops, Kirby, and and Stoops probably it had to be fourth, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was Kirby fourth. Kirby one year before Jimbo, right? Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, because yeah. or maybe two. Because I remember yeah, when Jimbo right got sixteen fired, eighteen. Yeah, I actually sat there with Tim Brewster and Jerry Schmidt <laughs> and watched Bama and Georgia playing for the national title. It was it was 
the night Schmidt was there for his interview. <laughs> We're leaving. Schmidt's my guy. I love that Schmitty, dude. Schmidt, he's like, don't tell anybody I was here. I was like, I got you. <laughs> I, by the time I walked to my car, it was on Texas. <laughs> yeah. Somebody had seen us at the Fox and Hound or wherever we were watching. But, but yeah, so Jimbo was fourth out of 14 at six years. And so now whoever's fourth probably, you know, has less than that. So it, it's yeah. the turnover is insane. Uh, you're right, Doring. And, and especially when you're trying to, I mean, AM went one way and they hired Jimbo Fisher. One and that, like we've already talked about all that, like what his resume was, how we all thought he would succeed. Um, and it didn't work. And then so many schools have gone the other way, which is what I think AM is more likely to do, which is try to get somebody, uh, you know, coming up. And I don't know, CD, are they going to find Urban Meyer or are they going to find Billy Napier? Mm. You know, and I'm not saying yeah. books closed on Napier, but you know what I'm saying. Like, yeah. these things, it, it, when you start going and doing that, it gets it gets a hell of a lot yeah. of talk. Yeah, it's going to be a new SEC next year as well, adding Texas and Oklahoma, two more big brands and one brand that certainly A&M has a history with. Actually, both brands they have a history with. So it's going to be interesting to see how all of that Luch plays out. Luch, you're the man. We appreciate you. You've yeah, been how on long 90... can we, we could do this with him for, yeah, like oh, two, for hours. two more hours. He's been on 97,000 radio yeah. shows and podcasts this week. So we appreciate being 97,001 because you've already <laughs> been on both of our other shows. Well, this is a better time of day for me anyway. I like <laughs> these well, usually, things, I, usually I got to talk a cocktail to, together. I, yeah, I, yeah. Well, I haven't yet. I'm going to leave here in a minute. I got, I got during y'all will like this weekend though for me. I'm doing George Strait in Fort Worth Friday night, driving back. I've got AM Abilene Christian, of course, 11 a.m. Saturday. Ugh. Yeah. Then Houston for Morgan Wallen. Then Sunday, drive to Dallas. Monday morning, I'm flying up to uh, Kansas City for. Chiefs Eagles Monday night. There football. you go. So we would little mini vacation yeah. after all this. But uh yeah, C D has I gotta go on at 8 a.m. My mom's texting me, like, why do your eyes she's sending me screenshots like <laughs> why do your eyes look like this? And they're all puffy. I go, Yeah, it's it's either Doring and it's Doring's fault or Alyssa's or it's Doring or PB's fault. Yeah. Or I'm getting mad at that setup CD because our camera, it's our secondary little stu temporary studio. Yeah. The camera's so close to my face. I thought you looked good. Right, bro. Right. And then like you and Burns on the screen are like this big. And then my head's like this <laughs> side by side. So we got, yeah. we got to work. On Happens this. to the best of us, Luch. Happens <laughs> to the best of us. Hey, we do appreciate it though, brother. All right, guys. Thank you. Later. all. I want to thank our guy, Billy Lucci, TexAx.com, and the guy who broke the story, as we mentioned multiple times on Sunday morning, that Jimbo Fisher was out at Texas A&M. So we do appreciate him hopping on with us and kind of giving us where College Station might be headed in the future for their head coach. Not the only coach, though, as you heard us ask Billy Lucci there at the end, that is out in the SEC. CD Zach Arnett is out at Mississippi mm -hmm. State, and we started to maybe throw some candidates out there who could replace Zach Arnett in Starkville, and it's a very interesting job. It is a job that I think has some real value, and CD, I think if you get the right coach in there, you could have the best hire of the coaching carousel season. And I truly mean that, okay, because some of the names that are attached to this job, I truly feel like it could be home run hires in Starkville. And I'm looking firmly at a couple of guys, Willie Fritz at Tulane, and I'm looking at Jamie Chadwell at Liberty. And when I say those two names, I don't want people to hear that and say, oh, well, he wants, you know, gimmicky offenses. You got to be gimmicky at Mississippi State. You don't have to be gimmicky. You have to have a great scheme. There is a big difference in, t in between being like a gimmicky offense and having a great scheme that's so different that people have to prepare for that scheme. And both of those guys have lived in different schemes. I mean, Willie Fritz was running the, the triple option at Georgia Southern. All right. He has kind of blended that with spread principles at Tulane, Jamie Chadwell, same situation. Look what he did with Grayson McCall. Like, look what he did with that quarterback. I mean, every year was like 26 touchdowns, two interceptions, 27 touchdowns, three interceptions. Like look at his stats this year. They're not close. Same thing for his current quarterback at Liberty. Last year, it's like eight touchdowns, five picks. This year, 
20 plus touchdowns. I think, I think he's got four interceptions. I mean, completely changed these quarterbacks. And he is somebody that I think can really come up with a game plan, regardless of talent level. Like you're going to be in the SEC, so you're going to have some talent, but you're never going to have Alabama, Georgia, LSU, Florida talent. It's just that's the way it is. But you have enough talent there in Starkville to be able to bring in Jamie Chadwell or Willie Fritz's offense and really marry it together with your scheme, and you can do something special. Like, I truly do believe that. I think you can get a coach that for what you're looking for could be better than even what Texas A&M might bring in. That's an interesting take because I think uh, a lot of people would would view that maybe as a second-tier job in the SEC. Um, but because it's a second tier job in the SEC, as it relates to funds, as it relates to even though Mississippi's got Mississippi's got a, a good amount of talent, it's not Texas uh, talent that that exists there. So there's a lot of challenges inherently, but it also makes them maybe go a little different route. And I'm I'm curious, you know, where A&M ends up going. Is it the big sizzle hire? Is it you know somebody that that maybe has a little bit uh, a lower profile? But for, for Mississippi State, you have to kind of do things a little bit differently. And I like all those names that you we talked an awful lot about you know, what, what Kleiman could do or or, or what Leipold could do or, or what Fritz could do. Like I, I, that that to me seems like, hey, let's go get a guy that's a proven track record of winning at every stop along the way that he's been. And, and any of those names that you mentioned, I think would be potential home run hires there in, in Starkville. And I, I want to ask you maybe a question that I – um, I had the discussion with somebody else about was like, do they need to do something different in terms of style? Like uh, there were, there was somebody saying, well, maybe they should go get somebody that's an air raid uh, uh, minded coach that could come in and kind of pick up a roster that was recruited for that and, and keep things going. Or do you, do you do things that, like Mullen at the time, the, the spread option offense that he kind of developed yeah. as the offensive coordinator of Florida was still very new. And they were able to find a quarterback in Dak Prescott that could run it really well. And, yeah, do you think you have to find something different from a, a schematic standpoint offensively to be able to win in a place like Mississippi State? Yeah, I think it has to be different, not gimmicky. Like different does not mean that you have to be somebody that is is running this unorthodox type of offense or defense. I just think that you have to have an identity. You have to have a plan. It does have to be something that teams don't see every week. Like that's the key component, right? Because when they play you, they know they have to dive back into it. They've got to come up with a game plan that is unique to what you do. I think that's important. And like Jamie Chadwell, again, like he's going to have, like he's got some of what Mullen did. Like he's got that in there and he's going to have something a little bit different. There's going to be spread option principles in his offense. And so for me, I think you do need that. I think when you're at a place that's going to have disadvantages in recruiting, well, you have to have something that is a little bit different. Like even, I would even say like what Lane Kiffin's doing a little bit, like in the tempo that they use, like those yeah. are different things that not everybody yeah. uses the same NASCAR type tempo that they use. And so for me, it just, it makes too much sense because what did Zach Arnett just try to do, right? It, it was like a masterclass in how to just completely go away from what was working for you. Which is, Each, which is funny though. What, what Like in hindsight, was that the ultimate undoing of the, the... you couldn't yes you, there's no way you could have have, have shown up and, and done anything worse in my opinion you tried to make Mississippi State and I look nobody loves grit more than I do but you try to be the grittiest team you you don't have those cats to do that certainly not right now not with what you recruited to so you were trying to line up in big boy people and you've been recruiting for the air raid like think about the teams that they played this year that are physical teams with with speed and size, they got mauled. They they couldn't do that. They yeah. couldn't do that with what they recruited to. And you were trying to line up and and run this pro style offense. That was never going to work, CD. That was a bad move. But really, possibly the hardest thing to understand is how a defense that returns so much experience and production, and the 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 mastermind of it all. Even though he moved into the head coaching position, how that defense ended up being as bad as it was is the thing that I think I'll never really understand. I, I understand yeah. why they failed trying right. to do something different in that Kevin Barbet offense, but how the defense wasn't better was a, my, a head scratcher for sure. All right, as we mentioned, not only one guest this week on pre-gaming the SEC, but we have multiple guests this week on pre-gaming the SEC as we start to get ready for that SEC championship game. 
All right, as I mentioned here on Pre-Gaming the SEC, very excited for our next guest, country music artist Travis Denning joins us now from Warner Robins, Georgia. He is a Bulldog through and through, actually went to Warner Robins High School in 2012. Jake Fromm went to that high school as well, if you'll remember. We won't say how many years before Travis went there, before Jake. We'll just say that he went to the same high school. How about that, Travis? Yeah, yeah, we did not pass each other in the hall. I'm a little <laughs> bit older than old Jake Fromm, but uh, yeah, for sure. Right, right in the middle of Georgia. And so, hey, what's that like being from Georgia and seeing this team that you have grown up, you have loved? I, I think I saw something like you've gone to like over 100 UGA football games. So to see them where they're at right now and probably realizing the potential that they always had and having some of those great teams in the early 2000s just could not, for whatever reason, get over that last hump. What's it like seeing them in this form right now? I mean, it is just – somebody told me last year – they were like, you know, I think we the good old days of Georgia football are right now, and it's just, you know, I've like like you said, I mean, I, I've seen it all. I've I've been in Sanford Stadium for a lot of heartbreak and a lot of fun, and I don't take it lightly. This is just a fun time to be a Georgia fan, and you know, everybody's been asking me, you know, we anytime I talk about football, like, are they three peating? Are they going mm. again? I'm like. Yeah. To be totally honest with you, I don't really care. I went and saw them win it in LA. <laughs> I watched them win it with my wife, you know, in 2021. I'm like, I, I'd like to three peat, you know, don't get me wrong. Yeah. I, I just, the happiness and the, the glory has superseded anything I ever thought I could experience as a fan. So I'm just happy. It's cool to live in a time where Georgia's a hundred percent a contender to do it again i think it's just fun yeah it's nice that you have a little perspective on it I, i'm like you travis I, I grew up in gainesville my parents were both florida grads I, I lived during the 80s when georgia was terrorizing my childhood and and uh then watching what florida was able to become you know had a little bit more uh, uh appreciation i think than some of the the newer fans that expected florida to be there every single year so it's nice that you have that background and more times than not we ask guys like who were your favorite players growing up? But I think the more interesting player, the question is, who did you hate the most? Because I hated <laughs> my, I, I hated Buck Blue, <laughs> Lindsey Scott, Herschel Walker. Those were the guys that I hated. So who were the ones that were the villains in your childhood? Oh man, I mean, well, you've got a jersey over your right shoulder right now. That was just a <laughs> word that didn't get spoke. And you know what? Like again, the older I get, the more I just enjoy the game of it all. Mm -hmm. I'm like. I got mad respect that Spurrier woke up every day and thought, how can I ruin Georgia's life? <laughs> I, I got respect for that because we all know Kirby wakes up and thinks, I, as long as I can beat Florida and Tennessee, every at least that's a good season in my yep. mm -hmm. And I love that. So Spurrier was a name that for sure just was the worst in our household. Um, as I got older, God, I despised Cam Newton because I just knew he was going to you know, whoop our ass pretty much for mm -hmm. lack of a better term. <laughs> um, you know, and even early on, I didn't really get to truly experience Peyton Manning because I was young, but like my dad was like, God, you know, just, and of course Peyton had always said in interviews, they said, what was your favorite thing about college? He said, beating Georgia every year that I went to school there. <laughs> like th Things yeah. like that make you go, Oh God forbid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's great. Isn't it the perspective that you have later on? Like, I, I feel like Spurrier, when I was playing for coach, was was vilified across the conference and i think everybody now appreciates him as kind of a a national treasure within the league and, and when he's not throwing barbs your way and he's not beating your team i think people can appreciate him for you know what he did for this conference and what he did for college football in general would you say that people have softened even georgia fans have softened towards coach spurrier now in his post coaching career i think so and also another reason that i've got respect for him is like he could dish it but he could also take it i mean i yeah. remember his last year at South Carolina and we, you know, Georgia beat the crap out of him and he just got up there and he was like, you know, they asked him about the game. He's like, you know, we just, we got our butts whooped. He's mm -hmm. like, I got out coach. He's like, it's like he get up there. And, and so I always had respect for the, all this college, you have, the flip side of the coin for your team. If you have it kind of boring, you know, you got to, there's got to be a dichotomy to it all, right? You got to have the ones you love and the ones that you, you don't like. So yeah, I think it's softened for sure. Perhaps what about like maybe 
some of the teams that you grew up loving, maybe some of the teams, because we mentioned that Georgia had talent. I know I played them in 2004 in Athens, and that was a team that was really talented. I mean, they beat the hell out of us at LSU that day. And, you know, David Green and David Pollock and Odell Thurman, all those guys are really good teams. Was that about the time that you started to really get like your favorite Bulldog probably around the early 2000s? And maybe who was that? Yeah. O two and O three, you know, when we went to the Sugar Bowl and played Florida State, that was such a big year for Georgia. And it was kind of, I guess that would have been Mark Rick's like second, second or third season. I can't really remember off the top of my head. But for me, um, Thomas Davis. Oh, uh, yeah. That's Greg a good one. Blue, and then, of course, the 2007 team, which just is the, you know, the what could have, could have, should have been kind of team. Uh, Matt Stafford, no Sean Marino, also Musa Smith back in the day, back going into the early yeah. 2000s. Terrence Edwards, I mean, just so many great players. But I think Thomas Davis was always one of my favorite dogs. I'll tell you this, and CD, CD knows what I'm about to say. I fumbled one time in my college career, one time, and it was because – I tried to test an all-American Thomas Davis in the open field in Athens, Georgia. And uh, I always tell people that story ends. Thomas Davis won, Jacob Hester nothing because that ball went up about 20 yards in the air. And I'm like, wait a minute. How are you an all-pro linebacker in the NFL playing safety in college? This doesn't seem fair. Yeah, this is somebody somebody <laughs> didn't look at some paperwork or something. That's right. Yeah. So, Trevor, you, you still living in Nashville? Yep, Nashville uh, just moved to a new house. I got married in May, so I don't recommend getting married and moving within six months of each other. A lot of decision making going on there, but uh, <laughs> we did it. Yeah, we're living here. I I literally yesterday I tracked the final song for what will be a full length record that's coming out next year. So I'm excited that. Oh, I'm that's got to be a great up. feeling. I've been working on this music for about. Oh God, I was so I, I went and got sake and sushi last night to celebrate. So it man, it's it's been fun. And uh yeah, January of next year will be 10 years in Nashville for me. Hey, I like uh I was reading through some stuff and and the the history of one of your songs that owed to uh your your fake ID back in the day. Like I think all of us remember the name on our fake ID. I found I what I somehow found mine that I ended up using in college. It was in the bank teller line. Like if somebody had left it in the tube and it looked somewhat like me, the dude's name was Kenneth Kurzweil. I mean, like I, I, you, you got to remember your, your first fake ID was yours. Somebody else's that you found, or was it one that, that somebody made for you or what? Yeah, this was an ID that a buddy of mine found and he found it on the floor of Bourbon street bar in Athens, Georgia, where all the freshmen go. And, oh yeah. Uh, and he called me and he was like, it's a skinny little white boy with a buzz haircut. Looks pretty good for you. And I was like, that's one of the weirdest backhanded compliments I've ever seen. Yeah. Thank you. And so, yeah, that was mine. He used it. And again, it's like when you really looked, didn't look a damn thing like me, but it was, yeah, it's just enough. And they kind of look at you going like, if you got 40 bucks in your pocket, you're going to yeah. spend it and we'll let it slide. Yeah. <laughs> My, mine worked until I caught my that pass against Kentucky has. And then I walked in uh, and they're like, yeah. Chris, we know this is not you. You know, you're not Kenneth Curtis. So that, that changed a little bit for you. Like wh when did it start where you're walking around and people are recognizing you and you gain that, that fame and notoriety? What, what was that transition like from being a little obscure, being the skinny white dude with a buzz cut to being somebody that everybody's recognizing and wanting to take pictures with? Yeah, I mean, I think it was probably probably when I had my first number one with after a few. And, I mean, that happened in the middle of the pandemic. So, yeah, I didn't really – I really wasn't walking around and seeing people. We weren't playing shows. But the first tour that we did back, we did like a 45-date tour with Brothers Osborne. And it was the first time that I got to, you know, sing my number one song and hear people sing back. And that was like, you know, going on stage and actually seeing people – you know, excited and expecting to see mm -hmm. you versus who's the guy opening for so and so. You know, yeah. I think that was probably yeah. it. What a crazy time to like be celebrating a number one. And I was like, I don't know True. if we're ever gonna play a damn show again. You know, it was it was <laughs> crazy, but definitely then. All right, let's get a little hypothetical. If uh, you know you've got the the biggest show, like you've got this all star cast of show that you're going to be a part of, and they're like, "Hey, it's going to start at this time," and you quickly open up your phone and you see that it's going to be, you know, Georgia playing in let's say an SEC championship game at the same time. How are you going to handle that? I know the earpiece is in your ear, so you can hear yourself, but would it actually be on the Georgia Bulldog call? So what I've done in the past is 
Um, I remember when Georgia opened up with Clemson in 2021 and we were on that brothers Osborne tour. Yeah. I have a little, just this little bar kind of countertop thing I made over COVID with my logo on it. And I keep my drinks on it, water towel. I straight up had my phone on it like this <laughs> and you couldn't see the phone. Cause it's a little recessed. And I I'm talking in between any verse or chorus or solo, I had my back to the crowd. I was just, <laughs> and of course, as you know, that game was like there was one touchdown score. Oh yeah, six, six. So it was just the most stressful game to watch. Mm-hmm. Thank God, I only played thirty minutes, but <laughs> unfortunately, I have to deal with that a lot. And I just, you got to go out there and rock it and, and suck it up and just have yeah. the TV waiting for you. So you said that that stand holds drink, water, towel. What's the cocktail of choice during the uh, the show? A Jack and Diet Coke. Okay. Never, right. never changed. It's been the same thing forever. I, it's like a placebo now. I yeah. Think. It's just like I love to have, I love to have one before the show, and then I'll make a second one and take it to the stage. I hardly, I hardly even touch it during the show, just because I'm, you know, like, in the zone. Yeah, but right. Just having it there is nice. It's funny though. I think there are different times, like cocktails for different times. Like when I sit. Not that I ever pay for first class, but when I get upgraded, for whatever reason, I oh always... yeah, like you never, <laughs> you never pay for first class. Oh, okay, for, no, but I, I get yeah. upgraded once in a while. But the the Jack and Coke is my drink of choice on the uh, the plane for whatever reason, man. I don't know if I'd I'd have one like if I go out to a bar, but I I feel like there's appropriate cocktails for different settings. I mean, is that is the Jack and Diet like across the board the go to cocktail, or do you do you uh, I mean... vacillate a bit? It's the overall, but yeah, I'm the same way. Like, I mean, I, I mean, I, I do love good tequila. That mm-hmm. tequila is the only thing I'll sip on the rocks or just sip straight. It's I, so there's times I do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I'm wa- especially watching a Georgia game, like, you know, those old Coca Cola like cups that they had and they'd yeah. be like this big and they were collector's <laughs> cups. Yeah. I've got so many faded versions of them and i that it's like i would just make the biggest jack and coke in one of those for a football that's game. not bad luck for, for drinking whiskey from tennessee against like tennessee this weekend i think I, it's a flex i, I, I think it's say, like I, yeah it's dropping the hammer a little bit you know it's like laying it down it's like, we, like it. we're gonna drink your whiskey but we're gonna beat your butt too. and yeah. you're also living in the midst of this like this uh, it, what i feel like nashville is kind of like it Atlanta. has to be a melting pot though right yeah, so I was gonna say like what's the representation of the different sec schools in nashville like it's, it's primarily Tennessee, but yeah, it's a little bit all over the place. You do see a lot of Georgia stuff. There's so much Alabama stuff here, and I don't I don't really know why. My guess is, I mean, I, we've got a lot of friends here that graduated from Alabama and stuff, and they just moved to Nashville. I mean, there's just there's so many people here, man. Mm-hmm. They're yeah, mainly Tennessee, Alabama, then Georgia, and just every now and then, you know, a random. South Carolina or Florida, but you don't see a lot of Florida or South Carolina here for some reason. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you, I, I grew up, you know, it was, it was customary to dislike Florida the most as, as vice versa for y'all. Yeah. To dislike the most. yeah. Well, when I moved to Nashville, I really got sick of seeing Tennessee orange very fast. So they, <laughs> they, they might've bumped Florida off of my number one. Uh, and, and I think it's just the colors. Cause you know, that Florida blue and orange is classic, but. I don't want to see a hunting vest every time I go out in public in a football season. <laughs> hey, don't worry. Us over at LSU, we'll take all the Florida hate that you want to give up, and we'll just take <laughs> more of it. So I, I can certainly deal with that, Travis. All right. Hey, what's the setup this weekend, though? What's the setup? How are you taking in the game, and how do you think the yeah, game you're gonna, not gonna go will to play not, out? Uh, to uh, Knoxville? I've I've got a show in South Carolina, so I'll I'll just be watching it on the bus. Mm. I am I'm playing this like you know, ATV park kind of deal. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it, we're, we're the, the entertainment for this festival they got going on. So I got to make sure I'm not parked under a tree. I got to make sure I got some satellite. So yeah. I'll be yelling at the, uh, the bus on the, the, the TV on the bus. Favorite player on the 2023 Georgia team, man. Man. I mean, Kamari Lasseter has just come into his own. I'm yeah, pretty mm-hmm. big fan of him. Uh, and I know he's second string, but Brock Vandergriff and I are pretty tight. I love him to death. And, you know, our Lord and Savior, Brock Bowers, as well. I yeah, mean, yeah. <laughs> hard to not have him the top three. Let me ask this question, man. I um, I had a text from an Alabama fan asking me, do you think Georgia's getting nervous about having to play Alabama in the SEC championship game? Is there any – I mean, it's funny, one, to think about teams 
looking at Alabama as maybe lesser than them, but that's kind of the dynamic between Georgia and Alabama. But do, is there any fear? I don't know how much Alabama you've watched this year. Any fear of what you've seen Jalen Milrow become and what that team has kind of evolved to? I mean, fully candid, I'm like absolutely nervous about it. I, I don't have a good feeling about it. That's just me. And I, I've got the longest explanation ever. But I think they – you want to talk about a team that had no identity, you know, yeah. and then all, and then they've just – they have just only gotten better. I mean, mm -hmm. these last couple games, like, it's just pure Alabama. Now, the dogs, for better or for worse, I feel like they play down and up to their competition. You know, it's like when we're, when we're yeah. playing – Carolina, we go down by 10 points for God knows why, but then we face Ole Miss and we play like an NFL team, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'm still super confident in it, but here's the deal. I mean, we lose this game. I don't, I don't think we make the playoff. I, I really don't. I think, I mean, I, I'm just trying, I'm trying to factor in all the outcomes and Florida state's not going to lose. And, you know, come on, I bro. You don't trust us to beat them next week. <laughs> Well, I mean, I sure. No, so. he said no. I heard him. He said I, no. You know, I <laughs> would like to see more of that LSU game, but you know, it's no big deal. I, I, don't, I just, I, I feel like that's not going to happen. And I just, the love affair for Ohio State baffles me every day. But I just still see some weird work around where both of those teams get in. But I think Washington's legit. I think for the first time ever, I do think the product of NIL and all those things, I think we're finally starting to see some talent get spread across the whole yeah. NCAA, which, and it's like, I think that's great, but I, man, if Georgia loses, we're definitely playing a, you know, playing some other bowl game. That's not a playoff game. I can tell you that. So we'll see. All right, Travis, before we let you go, man, you've been so gracious with your time and we appreciate it. What does your schedule look like compared to what Georgia's could look like? So SEC championship game, if they win that college football playoff semifinal finals, you mentioned you were out in L.A. I was also at that game and it was weird. I was doing interviews on the field and I was getting rained on inside of a dome. I don't really know how that happens, but it did happen. Not going to be there this year. Going to be in Houston. Do you plan on trying to follow the Bulldogs or is the schedule maybe too busy? My dad, my dad booked a hotel the third week of the season. So we've got a hotel booked and that's, Hey, that's what we did for LA when we beat yeah. South Carolina last year, my dad booked the hotel. So we're just keeping the tradition going. I probably will not, if they make the playoff, I've never been to one of the playoff games. Uh, I might keep it that way. It's just, it's new year's It's hard, you know? And if I tell the wife that I'm, I'm leaving to go watch Georgia on new year's, she might, uh, kick my ass so is she a georgia fan <laughs> she is a fan of who her husband roots for that's who okay. where's she from she's from kentucky uh lexington kentucky so she oh went to uk and then yeah. she, she graduated from louisville which is funny because they're they're rivals as well yeah. so she pulls for the dogs because i do and stuff okay so i will if we if we go to houston i'll be there without a doubt all right travis man thanks again we You're appreciate best, your man. time travis denny you can catch his stuff, I mean, it's all over the place. You can go to the AV park, and you can check him out there as well. Yeah, I've been exactly. to those things. Hey, you got to be careful at those things because you'll start seeing it. You'll want to get involved in all the action. Bring a four-wheeler, bring whatever you want, and some beer, and we'll watch the game. <laughs> there you go. That's Travis so Denny, good enough to join us here on Pre-Gaming, the SEC. Thank you, guys. All right, thanks again to country music artist Travis Denning, UGA fan through and through for hopping on pre-gaming the SEC. Isn't, isn't it fun to have those guys on that are so passionate about yes. like their team? And knowledgeable, and, too. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's not some like passive fan. This is a guy no. that's a, a super fan that's grown up with it. I can appreciate that. You can appreciate that. And I think most SEC fans kind of feel the same way about uh, their fandom or whatever yeah. uh, school that they've grown up with. Yeah, it's like this guy's out there playing venues, singing number one hits, and he's also got his phone up so he can watch Georgia and Clemson yeah. while he's trying to perform for thousands of people. There's something that is just fantastic about that. So we do appreciate his time as he gets ready to go play a show in South Carolina while his Bulldogs take on Tennessee. And speaking of that game, well, this is pre-gaming the SEC, so it is time to actually pre-game the SEC, and we welcome our guy Big Turp in to do so. Big Turp, small slate this week in the SEC. Some people have a different nickname for this week in the SEC. You won't hear that nickname here on this podcast, but what do we got this week in the SEC? 
Well, let's just go right into that Georgia Tennessee game we were talking about with Travis. Um, a few weeks ago, when we were looking ahead on Georgia's schedule, we identified this one in Knoxville as a possible problem game. You never yeah. know. Um, it's a 10 point spread as we sit here now. But when we look ahead in the college football playoff, we we kind of just chalk this up as a Georgia win. We say, oh, what if they lose to Bama in the championship? We count this as a win. Do you see an avenue for a Tennessee upset at home this weekend, 3.30 CBS? I don't see it. I think my mindset, Hester, has changed considerably on this game based upon what I saw in, in Mizzou last week. Like, yeah. I thought that Tennessee had done a great job of, of changing their dynamics of the team based on the line of scrimmage strength. And to see Missouri dominate them the way that they did uh, now makes me feel less confident that they've done anything to change what the narrative was last year. And that was Georgia's defense just being incredibly physical and, and, and keeping that offense from being able to one run the football or two have much time to throw the football. So I don't think it's going to be all that competitive. I know it's being played in Neyland and I'm not taking anything away from that home field advantage, but um, I, to, to me, the only way Georgia loses a game is if they they make a bunch of mistakes and play down yeah. to the level of competition. I haven't seen that. I asked Alyssa this on our, our show Thursday. When's the last time you can think of Georgia playing down to the level of competition and losing a ball game because they they imploded? I mean, even in the games where maybe they play down, they find a way at the end. I mean, they've done that a couple of times this year. And I can't imagine, CD, that they're not going to be fired up for this one. Right. And no disrespect to like Auburn or South Carolina, but we all know Tennessee, like that Tennessee Georgia game means something. So that was the game actually that all off season long, they were told, well, Georgia's going to cakewalk until they get yeah. to that game. Now it didn't turn out to be that way. It turned out that, you know, they had some dog fights against those teams that I just mentioned. And also they had a game against a really good Mizzou team. Mizzou was actually the team that we needed to circle all off season. We just didn't know that we thought it was going to be Tennessee on the road. But still, they heard it all offseason. Mm -hmm. This game, this game, this game, circle, circle, circle. And so I have to imagine, because again, Kirby does such a great job of getting his team ready to go. They know what kind of environment they're going into. I believe the last time Tennessee's lost a home game was Georgia in 21 when they visited Neyland Stadium. And so they are really good at home. And it's been a long time since they lost the game there. So I think Tennessee will put up a fight early, but it. I just I, I can't get what Missouri did out of my mind. They dominated on every single level. Georgia beat Missouri. Now, it wasn't domination, but they beat Missouri. And some of those things that they did in that game, I think they can do again in this game against Tennessee. And just even if Tennessee gives them the best shot, they're just going to jab and jab and jab until they throw the knockout punch. And being on the, you know, the road's going to be a challenge. But Georgia's been up for every single challenge that they've been faced with this year. Again, game for a little bit certainly early on i can see that being a situation but georgia once they throw that haymaker cd it's over yeah i'm with you on that and uh i think you know, the the more things uh, change the more they stay the same and the more things uh uh you know end up alabama and georgia in this conference yeah, know, as, right? as the big dogs <laughs> and uh we've already got that set for december uh but for now it's more about you know keeping the the schedule uh, unscathed as you make your way to that ball game in Atlanta and, and hopefully beyond to the SEC championship or uh, to the college football playoff. Yeah. All right, Big Terp, where are we going next? All right. Do either of you guys have any information to convince me that Kentucky, South Carolina is not a coin flip? Like, I got nothing here. It's in South Carolina, seven o'clock game. Kentucky's a one and a half point favorite. But if you told me South Carolina was the one and a half point favorite, I would not be surprised. Who you got? Uh, this is a game of disappointing teams to the standard I had them this year. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I thought Kentucky with Larry, a quarterback, was going to take a next step and they were going to be a top 15 team in the country all season long. Surprised that they're not. They haven't fallen off the cliff completely. South Carolina kind of has. And that's another shock. I knew what they lost in the portal CD, but I thought they had done a nice job of kind of replacing what they lost with very similar players as far as skill set and I know they've had some injuries and look Spencer Rattler has been tough as nails back there and they've had some offensive line issues this game to me is between two teams that I had very high aspirations for in the preseason and both have kind of let us down here on the podcast I still though if you're asking me like who do I favor in the game I'll probably still go Kentucky I still think Kentucky has more Jimmy's and Joe's right now available than South Carolina does I don't expect 
you know, expect it to be a very pretty played football game. I expect it to be a little bit muddy and mucked up. And I think at the end of the day, Kentucky probably wins an ugly one. I'll be honest with you, Hess. Uh, I feel like there are two teams going in different directions at this point. And I think as much as we talked in the offseason about what a great job Kentucky's done historically with the transfer portal and what a great get it was to get Devin Leary and how about those receivers returning, yeah. all of that stuff, if you don't have cohesiveness in the locker, Ray Davis may have been a thousand yard rusher at Vandy and had a great season, but like it doesn't feel like there's a chemistry in the locker room that's conducive to winning football games, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that's the one thing you can't account for when you're talking about hitting the transfer portal. You've been very vocal about the dangers of recruiting through the portal and how well or, or not well you, you, yeah. you end up getting to know these, these players. It, it's such a short period of time that you're dating there that, it, it, it's speed it's dating yeah, at, gonna, at best yes. it's speed dating and, and and i think the devin leary thing is one of the big disappointments to me this season yeah. and I'm, I'm gonna look you in the eyes right now i want you to remotely put your pinky up here and swear that we're not gonna do this anymore nope. we're put not up, falling for this we're put it up to the camera pinky ah. swear yeah we are I'm, not we are not we are not going to preseason hype kentucky like we had the last couple of years you got to prove us wrong. Yep. We have been your biggest fans. We have been out there just waving the Kentucky flag, and we have been let down. Mm -hmm. And not only have we been let down, we have been ridiculed multiple times because of this. Yep, yep. And I feel like the, the season could have – you know, you're up 14 nothing against Missouri at home. I, I think if you win that game, maybe the rest of the year goes a, a totally different route. But – how about the defense? I mean, the defense is the calling card of Mark yeah. Stoops' teams. Brad White's one that we've we've we recognize as being one of the best defensive coordinators in the in the country. They gave up 51 to Georgia, 38 to to what Missouri, 31 to Tennessee this past week. You know, they give up a, a ton to Alabama, what well, close to 50, right? So, like yeah. it, it the Mississippi State game doesn't even count. Uh, I just I don't I don't see the defense, I don't see them playing any better against South Carolina on Saturday. Yeah, I'm expecting again kind of a you know, a cluster muck type game, clunky, and I think Kentucky probably wins that game, but it's not the game that I expected it to be when we started talking about that game in the preseason. All right, Big Terp, I know we've got one more SEC game to talk about. We do, and it's two East teams that we talk about in very different ways right now. Missouri, number nine in the country, and Florida. And like we said before with Florida, it's not all bad. The offense has been solid, uh, but they're five and five, three and four in conference, while Missouri is still looking for a 10-win season. Any optimism that Florida goes on the road to Como and gets an upset win here, CD? Uh, not it's supposed to be 61 degrees it's not supposed That's to be true. the typical como that we have for this not matchup frozen furrow field like uh <laughs> our guy drink always wants to have when florida goes out there but um you know it, it's going to come down to the defense i mean i think florida will be able to score honestly i think they'll be able to put some points up i'm going to go on record right now and i know when i went on record last week and um you know it, it didn't go well for for my early picks arkansas loser Florida over against LSU. Yeah, was a I hit easy. Yeah. Your early over picks are great. Yeah, so I'm going to stay on that trend. Ride the train, <laughs> baby. Come on, ride the train over in South, uh, over in, in Missouri and yeah. Florida, please. I think it. What did we say it was, Big Turp? 58, fifty-eight and a half eight? right now. Yeah, give it. Lock me in at fifty-eight and a half right now. Over, please. Yeah, I don't hate that one. Uh, I think there's going to be some points scored in that contest. What about just? you know, the outcome of the game, like any opportunity you give Florida for going in there and taking care of business. What's the line at Missouri 11 and a half right now, Missouri just playing so well, playing for so much, right. Trying to get two 10 wins and what a 10 and two season would mean for them, but also for the Florida Gators trying to be bowl eligible and look, you got Florida state next week, CD. So you go number nine in the country this week, number four in the country next week. And if you don't get a victory, you don't go bowling. Honestly, Hess, I think it's more reasonable to think about Florida winning at home against Florida State than it is going to Como and winning out there against a very complete, very confident uh, Missouri team. 
I actually crazy enough because you know I think a lot of Florida State. I think you might be right. I think this trip's always kind of a sleepy one for Florida. I think Missouri's the better football team. Obviously, I think Missouri is right now as hot as they've been, even in a loss against Georgia. Think about it driving down six and you know, a play that you'd love to have back that probably wouldn't happen if you ran the same play 50 times. That happens. Your drive obviously stalls you turn it over they kick a field goal ends up being a nine point game but they play quality football in that game so yeah i think two teams probably going in the different uh direction there and i think florida at home would be you know a better matchup even against a very 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 good florida state team just because this one being on the road and that missouri team's playing as well as anybody so don't have a lot of hope for you here, CD. <laughs> Thank you. I pre- hope is gone at this point. We're just trying to trying to navigate our way yeah. to that December 20th signing day. Mm. All right. That is going to do it for us here. Again, a smaller SEC slate, but certainly games that have some meaning. Certainly that Georgia-Tennessee game, it is a top 25 matchup. Can Tennessee not only make that a game, but pull off the massive upset, which team is going to find its way in the win column and it needs one so badly in Kentucky and South Carolina. And then can Florida be bowl eligible? Can Missouri continue to fight to get to 10 wins in the regular season? So small slate, but still a lot of meaning behind these three games we have in the SEC. That's going to do it for week 12 of pre-gaming the SEC next week. Well, we get back into a full slate of SEC action. It is rivalry week. We have games certainly that, regardless of win-loss record, will certainly move the needle. We'll have those covered in every single way for you next week on pre-gaming the SEC.